Thank you, King Frank. I, I was sitting there beside Mervyn, and Mervyn was saying to me, he's going next, but King Frank, I just changed the batting order, as he has the right to do. When Wes came up here, he was saying, thanks for the privilege and the invitation to come to speak about Viv. Well, I am a substitute. I wasn't originally on the team, but a man got a broken toenail, and I, I was called to replace him. But it's a great honor here to come and say a few words about Viv. I just want to tell a few stories about my experiences with Viv. Because you go back many years from we were youngsters. Not that we're not youngsters. No, I'm still feeling kind of sprightly. <laughs> but I'm still talking about going back many, many years when we were in our early 20s. Because that was the first time I came across Viv when Viv came to Jamaica to play for what was then the Combined Islands in Shell Shield. And I was 12th man for Jamaica. I had yet made the Jamaica team. You had people like Maurice Foster and Renford, Pinnock and Eastern Mark Morrissey captain and those people playing for Jamaica. And I was just a youngster getting into the squads then. And Viv came, played for the Combine Islands, and you could see the class of the man immediately. Didn't get any big scores in that particular game. I think he, score books might correct me, but I think he prob probably made in the 20s. But if Viv made 23, he had five fours. And it was five classical shots, five fantastic shots. And I think that was what Viv did in those early days. Played some fantastic shots, but didn't bat for a very long time. But he was a youngster, learning the ropes. And as we saw, he got better and better. And started to play some fantastically long innings with some fantastic shots within, within those innings. My first tour was to Australia, 75-76. And of course, it wasn't the most happiest of tours. Viv was on that tour. Had a few rough periods at the beginning of the tour. And then I remember we went to Tasmania. Those days when we went on tours, it's not like current tours when you go on a tour these days and you play test matches, you play one day internationals, and nowadays this Biff Buff 2020 thing that they have. And you might play... You might play one or two, three or four day games and you go home. When we went to Australia 75, 76, we played against every state. And we played against some states twice. And we played at least five lead up games before we even played our first test match. So we had a lot of cricket. First test match, Brisbane, disaster, we lost. We didn't make a lot of runs. I think it was about the third test match when we got, before we got, we got to Tasmania, and then Clive Lloyd, stroke of genius, did it many times, just assessed the situation and tried something different, and it worked. He said to Viv, you're going to be opening the batting against Tasmania. Not a great team in Australia at the time. They didn't have a lot of outstanding cricketers, but they still had a few good cricketers. Viv opened, big score, century. Went to the next test match, and of course, got his runs, Slipped back down the order afterwards when he got his confidence and everything. And of course, we know what has taken place since then. But on that very first tour, 75 76, we used to joke a lot because with the thumping that we were getting, we had to find ways of keeping ourselves happy and to joke about things. And Viv and Lawrence Rowe were great buddies. I think Viv kind of appreciated the way that Jagger Rowe batted. And they went around a lot together joked a lot together, and I don't know how many of you know that when Lawrence Rowe was batting, he used to whistle. He would be playing his strokes and be whistling. <laughs> but on that tour after the first test match, Jagger Rowe stopped whistling. <laughs> because when Lily and Thompson and Gary Gilmore were steaming in, it was a little bit difficult to be whistling and batting. And I remember Viv sitting down beside Yaga Row in the dressing room one day and said to Yaga, Yags, what happened to the whistling thing, man? <laughs> and Yaga gave the same explanation I just gave. It's a little bit difficult to be whistling with those people. And I remember Viv and Yaga discussing, because of course those days the equipment that we had wasn't as fantastic and as protective as the equipment we have now. The pads, for instance, people used to be putting towels down inside the pads because those guys bowling at those, that pace those days don't know what pace it was because we didn't have the fantastic 
high polluting equipment that we have now to measure the, the speed of balls. But if these guys bowling 90 odd miles an hour now, they were bowling over 100 then. Because when that ball hit your pad, you would feel it right through the pad. And I remember Viv and Yaga sitting down and discussing that and choosing towels to go into the pad. I remember it happening specifically in Adelaide. And Viv in the dressing room looking at Yaga Row, and Viv says he had fantastic eyesight, as you know. Viv says you could see in the dressing room the lanes in Yaga Row's forehead when he was <laughs> concentrating so hard. And of course, nothing coming from the lips. But we used to joke about it. We used to joke about the bowlers bowling necktie balls because Thompson and Lily were around your neck all the time. But those were just formative years. And as we know, after 75, 76, we just kept on winning. We learned a lot from that tour. We kept on winning and we became a great team. My next tour was 76. And I have to confess to you all, although you know, that Viv broke the record for the most runs scored in a series and in a calendar year on that tour. It could have been more. I don't know if you remember that Viv missed the test match. I missed the first test match. Nottingham, Trent Bridge. They said I had glandular fever, but that's rubbish because if I had glandular fever, I would not have been able to play the rest of the tour. As a matter of fact, that's what the doctors told Clyde Walcott, the manager then, send him home because he will have, be of no use on this tour. I was rooming with Viv. When I got out of hospital after the first test match, went back to room with Viv. Whatever I had, Viv caught. <laughs> Viv missed the next test match. I think it was Lords. And yet, the man still went on to get all those runs and to break the record. So I have to hold my hands up, Antiguans. It could have been worse for the rest of the world if Viv hadn't caught what I caught. But that's just to show you how fantastic a player he was and how much improvement and how much he had matured since that 75, 76 tour in Australia. Because those English bowlers hadn't got a clue what to do and where to bowl. I remember Tony Gregg saying the th similar thing that Wes just said about playing through the onside. He said he would pack the onside because he knew Viv loved to play through the onside and he would keep Viv quiet, and eventually he would give, it up, give away his wicket. He had two men at mid-wicket, catching at mid-wicket. Viv kept on placing the ball between the two men, down to the boundary of four, and Tony Gregg kept on adjusting them, because he thought it, Viv was doing it by luck. He would adjust them a little bit more, and say, yes, that is the right angle now, and Viv would just turn the wrist a little bit more, or keep the bat face a little bit straighter, pass them again for four, and he would keep, keep on adjusting them. Forever and ever. He just could not accept that the man was that good to be hitting out swingers from half stump through mid wicket. He, he thought it was our luck. I think by the time Bib got to 150, he realized it wasn't luck. <laughs> and as we know, Bib got so many runs on that tour. 291, I think it was at the Oval. But my greatest pleasure with Bib and his batting was actually being at the other end with him in a one-day international at Old Trafford. We seemingly were on our way to losing that one-day international. Nine wickets down, 100 and a little bit on the, on the scoreboard, not a lot. And I walk out with Viv, and Viv says to me, Mr. T, because that was my nickname. I don't think too many of you know that nickname. Mr. T, just stay at the crease. I will take as many balls as possible. If you have to face a ball, just block it. I say, okay, Smokey. I know you know that nickname, so I don't have to explain that one. <laughs> I say, okay, Smokey, but don't give me too many balls, please. <laughs> so said, so done. We've kept on blasting the ball all past parts of the park. And of course, at the non-strikers end, as anyone will tell you, you need to back up because you can't just stand on your bat in the crease. You need to back up in case there's a quick single. Initially, I was backing up, but after a while, I stopped backing up because I was getting two, three feet down the pitch, and when the ball was coming back at me, I didn't have much time to get out of the way. So I wasn't backing up that much later on in the innings. But it was like a dream just standing there and watching the man. Bob Willis. Ian Botham, um, 
Derek Pringle, Foster, I don't remember Foster's thing, it might be Neil Foster. They were disappearing all parts of the ground. He was backing away, hitting them over extra cover into the members stand at Old Trafford. When they tried to follow him, when he backed away, he would just step back in and hit them over mid-wicket. Anywhere, anytime. But during that innings, when we sort of settled in and we was going so well, and this partnership now was approaching eight yard runs, perhaps I had scored about two out of the eight yard. I went up to Bib with this brilliant idea. Bib is there chewing his gum and hit, hitting the top of the bat, you know, the way he hits his bat, and the two of us in the middle of the pitch. And I go up to Bib with this brilliant idea, and I say, Smokey, sometimes when you take off for the single, or the two that you think it might be, and it's not two, and then I have to face. Let us try a thing here. I say, well, what is that now, Mr. T? I say, well, you running, because he's hitting everything in front of him. You running, you are seeing the fielder. I am running with my back to the, to the ball. I will run the entire distance and come back. But if you see the fielder, looks as if he might be able to run out somebody before the, you get back, Stop halfway and turn back. I will run the entire thing. The umpire will call one shot, but we still get one run and you back and strike. Poor me, I didn't know that was against the law. <laughs> and up until my career had ended, I still didn't know. I only learned that when I became a commentator. But that's not the story. This thing is with Viv. On one occasion, bang down the ground again and Viv takes off looking for two and I go to my end and spin around and take two steps and Viv says no, no, no because I realize he can't get back so I'm no on strike before the bowler bowls the ball I go down to Smokey I say Smokey you don't remember the plan man <laughs> so you're Smokey what was that again Mr. T <laughs> Smoking was just in his zone he was hitting the ball so well scoring runs so freely my plan just went through one year and out the next. And it didn't matter. As you know, we put on 180 yard runs together. And we won the game quite comfortably. But it was an honor to be standing at the other end and watching him. And of, all, of course, looking at the faces of some of the England players when they realized things were, were, were slipping away. I think that was early 80s. And Viv and myself played together for another five years or so. And when you talk here, we talk about a man that is committed to the game, a man dedicated to the game, and not just for his own sake, but for his country's sake. I can tell you an incident, incident that I remember clearly in Australia. I think where well, it might have been my job, I'm not too sure. Viv had a bad back. You know these days, the slightest thing, I'm, a man cracking fingernail, him can't play. Feel a little niggle. Coach, can't make it. Can't even warm up. Viv had a bad back, Melbourne, I remember it was, in that dugout dressing room. And it was important for Viv to play this game. I think it might have been one of the finals. We had best of three finals. And Viv could hardly walk around. I stood there and watched this man take an injection in his back to play that game. When I say watch it, I should say glimpse it, because when the needle was going in, I was kind of looking how we are. The needle was long, believe me. And that is the sort of thing that I saw Bib go through for his country. He didn't go through it for him. Bib make runs morning, noon, and night. So if he misses one game, no big thing. But he knew it was important for him to play that game. It was, he knew it was important for his country for him to be out there to play that game. So when people come to me and ask me, not calling any names, but some great players that they see it last 10, 15 years, and they said to me, compare that person with me. I said, sorry, you don't compare people with me, Richard. You don't compare people with Pele. You don't compare people with Muhammad Ali. Those people are on their own, and then you talk about the rest. As an all-round batsman, I ain't comparing with, with anybody. He might not have the highest test score, but that was because Bib didn't want the highest test score. When Bib got 150 and he figured the team gone 300 and odd, with the bowling that we had, Bib said, well, time to enjoy myself. If I get out, no big thing. Hit a six, hit a four, whatever, and he gets out. If Bib 
was determined to score the highest ever test score, he would have scored that highest ever test score. The only occasion I can remember playing with IBA Richards and seeing him trying to get a huge score was that same 291 at the Oval because it was over different days. And I remember him going out on that day when he got out, looking quite fresh, and all of us thought, this is it. And Tony Gregg got him out. And Tony Gregg was dancing and celebrating as if he had gotten him out for a knot. I don't think he was looking at the scoreboard. But that's the only time I can remember ever seeing Viv thinking, this is a big one. The series had already ended. We had won the test series. This was the last test match. No big thing if we had drawn the test. We went on to win the test match anyway. But no big thing if it was drawn. And Lloyd had told them that. So it was there to try and get the big one. But Viv considered himself an entertainer. Go out, get as many runs as my team needs, enjoy myself, come back in. He would get bored at the crease. I could see it. A lot of us could see it, could watch Viv get bored at the crease. And when boredom set in, at some point he would get out. Look at Viv's scores. There are plenty of centuries, but not 200 and never 300, because Viv wasn't that person. He wasn't looking for that. He wasn't looking for self-gratification, looking for the team. And when people saw that red, green, and gold thing around his hand, people started talking about black power signs and all that. I remember pointing to an Englishman once because there was a BP advertising hoarding on the ground in England. And the BP advertising hoarding had on the red, green, and gold. And I pointed out to the Englishman, I said, see black power there too? <laughs> Colors that the man identified with. It wasn't anything about black power. Black consciousness, yes, because he knew he was a black man. He knew he was doing more than just playing cricket for himself and the West Indies. He was playing cricket for, for everyone that he could identify, that could identify with him. But Viv was now there, me versus you because you're white and, and I black. Otherwise, he wouldn't make so much runs against the Indians. They're just as brown as him. Viv was there playing cricket, but he understood what it all meant to Caribbean people, of course. When you look at Viv as West Indies captain, as Wes just said, never lost a series. How many people can walk around the world and say that? How long did Viv Richards play the West Indies? Win test series as a player, continuing on as captain, and continuing to take the baton forward that Clive Lloyd had given him. I, V, A, Richards. Antigua must be very proud of that man. Obviously, the powers that be recognize what Antigua have, the only living national hero, Sir Isaac Vivian Alexander Richards, all the honors bestowed on the man, so it's obvious that Antigua and the powers that be recognize what they have got. 60 years old IBA, if we could all live to 120 and still be strong and healthy, I would wish that for you, but I know it's almost impossible to get there and to be still strong and healthy. And I would not like to see IBA Richards not strong and healthy. So I ain't going to wish you another 60 survive, but I wish you many, many, many more and for you to be as here as long as you want. Thank you, everyone.